If you ever had a question how to use your sexual relations to ruin the country, this video is just for you. Second part of the introduction to the history of the Hundred Years' War, more precisely story about Edward II and his witty favorites. Stay tuned. In the previous video we spoke about lands England had in France. It was since the conquer of England by William the Conqueror and reached its pinnacle during the reign of Henry II. But John Lacklands lost almost all lands in France. Edward I tried to get them back, but the rebellion in Scotland forced him to return. He died on the way to Scotland, ordering his son Edward II to conquer Scotland and return lands on the continent. Edward II in Chronicles described as unpleasant and incompetent in state affairs. He, as his father, was tall and attractive. He was a good rider, but he didn't like chivalry and the common system of rewarding distinguished persons, which was rather fair in distributing position titles and lands, raising the loyalty of people King could rely upon. Edward II didn't shower favors barons who were ready to serve him, but rather gave lands and titles to two of his favorites who provide him with intimate service. That time, in the church's eyes, homosexuality was a sin equal to heresy. Even lay people considered it as a terrible vice. However, that wouldn't take him very seriously if he at least tried to conceal them. Some contemporary sources allege Edward's relations with his favorites were not reprehensible, but were a form of brotherhood in arms, which confirmed by the fact Edward was accused of homosexuality during his life, but not after his death. Edward and both of his favorites had wives and children, but they did need heirs, and it is not unusual for homosexuals to have wife and children. In the Middle Ages it was not unusual for men to share a bed, Thus, for example, in English barracks one bed was provided for two or even three men. But the fact Edward, after the night of his coronation, shared the bed not with his wife but men, looks very unusual indeed. Barons expected Edward in homosexuality, so they included in coronation speech the obligation to obey the laws and customs of the kingdom. One of Edward's second favorites since the time he received Prince of Wales title, Pierre Gaveston, Gascon Knight, who loyally served Edward I, who knighted him. Edward II gave him a title which only blood princes had, Earl of Cornwall. Gaveston was a smart and attractive young man and a good administrator. Besides, he participated in tournaments and accompanied King in the hunt. But despite being favorite of the king, he had an easy life. It would be easier for him if he could hold his tongue. Instead, he gave funny nicknames to the noblemen. Thus, for example, he called Earl of Lincoln, who was a rather fat burst belly, Earl of Pembroke, Joseph the Jew, Earl of Lancaster, Edward's cousin, richest man in the country and, and owner of a large army, the Fiddler, and Lord Warwick, the Black Dog of Arden, from the forest of Arden in Warwickshire. He not only made fun of noble persons, but humiliated them with victories in the tournament. Gaveston married King's niece, though he had never achieved such hates in normal circumstances. But Edward thought otherwise, and even appointed him as a temporary ruler of a country when left to France for his bride. So, by his own actions and the position of a highest king's advisor, he managed to make a lot of enemies. He was exiled three times, once during the reign of Edward I and two times during the reign of Edward II, who was forced to do this under the threat of Baron's rebellion. When Gaveston returned from his third exiles, Baron uprised. Gaveston was captured by the enemies, among those was Earl of Warwick, and by the decision of the court, most likely not legal, executed. Nobody accused King in an effective rule in that time but incompetent advisors, in our case Gavestons. Edward could not do anything, he was just mourning his dear Pierre. But Edward would have his revenge later. Despite the death of Gaveston, by 1314, Baron's opposition, unhappy with Edward II's ruling, sufficiently grew. Edward didn't accomplish his father's order to conquer unyielding Scotland. As a result, Scottish returned sovereign lands. Now Edward decided to raise his prestige by victorious war with Scotland and started to call barons to arms. 
Earl of Lancaster and some other barons strongly refused, claiming Parliament even hadn't reviewed the war's financing. But Edward insisted, and in June 1314, he and 10,000 men army was defeated in the Battle of Bannockburn by inferior Scottish army. Edward went for the battlefield. To be honest, it was against his will, but by insisting of his court. English lost about one third of the army, and though it was a real tragedy for Edward II, this defeat started army reform, which immensely helped in domination of English army over French one in the Hundred Years' War. After unsuccessful campaign, position over Edward became even more difficult. Scottish renewed raids on the English northern territories, besieging Berwick upon Tweed. In the meantime, no, during, during the meanwhile, ah, during the meanwhile, yes, that's my perfect English, Edward got new favorites, father and son dispensers. They were even more mercantile than Gaveston was. And Hugh Dispenser the Younger had not only political ambitions, but the ability to get his own way, and barons rightly considered that the new favorites pose a serious threat to their prosperity. We said Edward had a homosexual relationship with Dispenser the Younger, but there are even less proof of that than those of relations with Gaveston. However, he was much closer than a close friend. Dispensers, taking advantage of their privileged position, tried to receive as many lands as possible, while not abhorring violent measures, from extortion to outright threats, and sometimes used brute force and open alienation of lands in their favor. The landowners of Wales and the borderland between England and Wales were especially indignant at their actions. Earl of Lancaster was extremely furious when the profitable lands that he aimed for himself went to Hugh Dispenser the Younger. At 1321, indignation of Dispenser's actions reached the limit. The landowners of the lands on the border between Wales and England, with the support of Lancaster and some guy Roger Mortimer, addressed Parliament with a claim against Dispenser's. They were accused of dismissing competent officials and replacing with their own people without administrative abilities, who even thought only for their own benefit of misappropriating other people's property, and of not being able to get an audience with the king without the presence of one of the dispensers, and the other sins that prevented the king from making the right decisions. Unable to resist the broad opposition, Edward agreed with Parliament and the dispensers were exiled. After that, Edward did finally manage to succeed in his military campaign. Earl of Lancaster, despite his riches, was not neither good military leader nor politician. He also had many enemies of his own, and Edward, by passing Parliament, called both dispensers and returned them from the exile. During the military campaign, Edward captured Leeds, castle in Kent, and after executing the remains of a garrison, turned north. Meanwhile, Lancaster, who gathered the army, went north too, most likely to ask Scottish for shelter. However, in March 16, 1322, he ran into the army of Edward near Borough Bridge beside River Ur, which blocked the only bridge across the river. Royal bowmen prevented Lancaster to cross the river by fort, and his army started to flee, and he was captured by Edward. In Pontefract, Lancaster was accused of treason. He most likely hoped for fine or exile, as he had royal blood, he was grandson of Henry III, but it was time for Edward to avenge the death of Gavinstone, and the only indulgence for Lancaster was he was beheaded, but not quartered. Lancaster was not popular, but Edward and Hugh Dispensers were so unpopular that Lancaster became martyr, saint, and to pervade pilgrimage of a people who hoped for miracle to his grave, Edward ordered to place guards who turned away everyone who wanted to see the dead. French king Philip IV affair, because of his appearance, and his wife Joan of Champagne had three sons and a daughter Isabella, who was born in 1295. In 1299, Edward I tried to solve with Philip all disputes regarding Aquitaine and married Philip's sister Marjorie, his first wife died in 1290, and his elder son, future king Edward II, was betrothed to Isabella. Marriage of Edward and Isabella was made in Boulogne in 1308, when Edward was 24 and Isabella 13. Isabella gave birth to their first son, future king Edward III, 
in 1312 when she was 17. Edward II most likely performed his dynastic duties occasionally. Nevertheless, Isabella gave her birth in 1316 of John and then two daughters, Eleanor in 1318 and Joan in 1321. Isabella was probably offended and humiliated, noting that her husband gives preference to Gaveston, in particular when she discovered that King's favorite not only wears diamonds donated to Everett by her father on her wedding day, but also her personal jewelry brought with her from France. Despite these grievances and insults, she supported Edward II, although she sometimes complained that she didn't have enough money, while Gaveston would waste money on and off. Since 18th century, historians accused Isabella calling her she-wolf of France. She was accused of adultery, fighting against her husband, and even contributing to his death. Well, perhaps his accusation are true, but recently historians start to change their opinion about her, taking into account her tragic fate. In the end, the majority of her marriage she was loyal and supported Edward II. She accompanied him in his military campaign, almost always unsuccessful ones, and in several times she was trusted with the great seal of her realm. Isabella was an educated woman, well versed in both domestic and foreign policy. As a daughter of the French king Philip IV, and after his demise in 1314 as a sister of King Louis, Isabella acknowledged her position and behaved with dignity in defiance of neglecting by her husband. It is possible that it was not good from Isabella's side that she informed her father Philip IV of the adultery of the wives of her two brothers with the covenants of the wife of her third brother. But she must have known that if she concealed this information, she herself might arouse her father's anger and face painful consequences. The wife of her brother Louis was Marjorie of Burgundy and the wife of another brother Charles, Blanche of Burgundy. Marjorie and Blanche were sentenced to life imprisonment underground in Chateau Galar and Jeanne was acquitted. The importance of Isabella English history should not be judged by separate actions. For us, it is more important to evaluate her role in starting the Hundred Years' War. The relations of Edward II with Gaveston, although they had Isabella, did not at least threaten neither her rights to movable and immovable property, nor her safety. But relations of Edward with Despenser threatened both. Prior to the exaltation of these arrogant favorites, Isabella supported her husband in the fight against the barons and took his side in disagreements with Philip IV and her brothers. At first, Isabella tolerated the Spencers, as she did with Gaveston before them. But then her attitude towards them disoriented sharply, and this was why. The Spencers began to set the kings against her, suspecting that Isabella was in collusion with enemies, which was most probably true and then persuaded Edward II to take from Isabella her lands as an independent source of funds in the face of arrogation of Anglo-French contradictions. Isabella supported Edward II in his foreign policy when the war in Aquitaine resumed in 1324 and even approved her husband's will to send dispensers to negotiation with her brother Charles IV. Charles ascended the French throne, succeeding his brother Philip V, who died of dysentery, without leaving a direct heir. Charles was a good friend of his sister, but believed that she could be manipulated to use her to have the desired effect on Edward II. Isabella realized that dispensers were hostile to her, but being a smart woman she did not reveal that, and she was unhappy with influence at the court. Moreover, leaving for France, she kindly said goodbye to Hugh Dispenser the Younger and wrote him a friendly polite letter from Paris. In conversation with her brother Charles, Isabella sincerely wanted to re-establish Anglo-French relations and achieve an acceptable solution for both parties. Anglo-French disagreements concerned primarily to the form of homage, the contract between Seigneur, King of France, and Vassal, King of England. The English king, as the vassal of French king, was obliged to pay the lord of a feudal lord for the right to own the continental lands, which France agreed to transfer to English. Simple homage was limited to this, but the French king insisted on close homage, according to which the English king should also serve the French king. The English monarchs considered this form of homage completely unacceptable. More, according to the treaty made by Henry III, 
He was the lord from whom English held the Duchy of Aquitaine. Part of the homage was promising not to bear arms against the King of France, which put them in a difficult position then when he encroached on their territory on in future when Edward III decided to assert his claim to French crown. When it was time for Edward II to pay homage to the French king, he decided to go to France himself, but the Spencers, fearing that in the absence of a king their position at court would hesitate, persuaded him not to go, and Edward made a decision, perhaps at the insistence of Isabella, to send in his place the eldest son, the Prince of Wales, by transferring French lands with proper titles into his possessions. Presumably Isabella did really influence her husband, perhaps she was going to settle Anglo-French disputes, or maybe she wanted to confirm once again the inheritance rights of her eldest son to the English throne. In any case, on September 12, 1325, the 12-year-old Edward, Prince of Wales, sailed from Dover to France with his retinue, consisting of two bishops and several knights, and on September 24, in Vincent's paid homage to his uncle Charles IV. Having achieved the transfer of English lands in France to her eldest son and settled the English-French disputes, Isabella, who was in Paris at the time, could return home with him. But under various pretexts she postponed her departures, until Edward II began to insist on her immediate return. Isabella made it clear that she would return England only when the king sent dispensers to exile. At that time, aristocrats who were expelled from England or simply dissatisfied of English policy and left the country on their own initiative began to make acquaintance with Isabella. These acquaintances were reported to Edward by both the people sent to him in France, whom he had ordered to return Isabella to England, and by the people Isabella's entourage, whom she sent home because she could not longer maintain due to the lack of funds not replenished by Edward. Though her brother Charles IV willingly paid her bills, he stopped that when a scandal erupted in which Isabella and Roger Mortimer were involved. Roger Mortimer was born in 1287 in a rather rich family who owned lands in southern England, Midland, Ireland, Wales and on the border between England and Wales. When his father died in 1504, guardianship of Roger until his coming of age at the behest of Edward II was entrusted to Gaveston. This guardianship was extremely profitable, for the guardian could use very significant income from his estates for his own needs. In 1306, when he reached adulthood, Roger paid Gaveston 2,500 marks for the guardianship, about $200,000 at current prices. When Roger came at age and took possession of his estates, Edward I knighted him. Subsequently, Mortimer participated in the coronation of Edward II, Sir Edwin Aquitaine participated in the suppression of the uprising in Wales, served for two terms as Supreme Judge in Ireland, where he administered justice with the same success as peacemaker can maintain order in a country where there is no laws. In 1420, Mortimer joined the Barons of Wales, who organized an armory buff to the Spencers, who sought to expand their possession in Wales at the expense of local landowners. Of course, dispensers were annoyed by this resistance. Besides, dispenser the younger hate Roger Mortimer and considered it perhaps a duty, as in the custom of blood feud of Pushtuns have, to avenge Roger for the death of his grandfather, who died at the hands of a relative of Mortimer at the Battle of Isham in 1265 year. Remember? Who had been dismembered and sent to his wife, Pashelli. The outbreak of war unleashed by barons, dissatisfied with the arbitrariness of the dispensers, did not last long. On March 16, 1322, the royal army defeated the army of barons in the decisive battle of Borough Bridge. But even earlier, on January 23rd, Roger and his uncle Roger Mortimer de Kirk were captured by the king at the Battle of Shrewsbury. They were sentenced to death. But they managed to avoid the terrible fate of many other rebels. The execution was replaced by life imprisonment in tower. Roger did not stay in prison for very long. On August 1st of 1323, taking advantage of the negligence of the guards, he escaped from prison, crossed the Thames on a boat, got to Dover on a purchase of a stolen horse, crossed the English Channel 
on the ship and appeared at the cars of Charles IV, who welcomed him cordially. In France, Roger got along with people expelled from England. Some of these people spent time at the court of French king and time at the court of Count of Anno, the owner of a border region with Flanders. But Roger's uncle remained at the tower where he died in 1326, when he was 70. After staying in Paris for about a year, Roger moved to Anno, where he began to collect troops and money for the evasion of England. And the information from England came from the barons, dissatisfied with the arbitrariness of the dispensers, who assured that if Mortimer invaded England, they would revolt and help him. Isabella probably first met Mortimer at the funeral of an elderly Count of Valois, when Mortimer arrived in Paris in the retinue of Countess of Anno. Both Mortimer and Isabella hated self-serving dispensers, and they were destined to meet, especially since Mortimer constantly maintained contact with the English emigrants displeased with the rule of Edward II grouped in Paris around Isabella. Relations between Isabella and Roger were not limited to a commonality of a political interest. And at the very least in early 1526 they became lovers. If at the time for married men it was normal to have a mistress, we add to Roger's excuse that by the time he had been separated from his wife at least three years, then adultery of married ladies was considered a real crime and even for the queen it could have caused extremely undesirable consequences. If Isabella knew about possible danger that could have come upon her for adultery, it is not known for sure, but even if she did, Isabella could be understood. The king paid her too little attention, preferring to spend time with dispensers. Edward II quickly found out about their relationship and multiplied his attempts to return his son to England, even without a mother. He wrote to French king, pope, son, but all his efforts were in vain. Meanwhile, rumors began circulating about the possible invasion of the troops of Roger Mortimer in England, and in summer 1326, Edward II began to assemble an army, organize patrols of English coastal waters, put the coastal defense on alert, seized Isabella lands and confiscated her money placed in a tower. He also tried to arrest Mortimer's mother, but she disappeared in advance. In July 1326, Edward, unable to turn Charles IV to his side, declared war on France. In the end, Edward's appeal to Pope, who at the time lived at Avignon, brought certain result. John XXII, trying to establish good relations between English and French, instructed the nuncio to arrange negotiations between Isabella and her husband. He condemned the adultery of Isabella and reported this to Charles IV. As we already spoken, Charles had cheated by his wife, so he sympathized with Isabella, his sister, but nevertheless decided to remove her from himself, but apparently did it delicately, noting her ahead of time that it would be nice for her to leave Paris. In addition, he allowed Isabella to take with her all her savings. Perhaps at that time, if not earlier, Isabella realized that although the dispensers remained her enemies, the main opponent was her husband Edward, King of England. Having escaped from the tower, Roger always sought to overthrow Edward II, and Isabella wanted to help him with this, especially since the king's son, the Prince of Wales, was with her. Roger and Isabella left Paris to Pontru, a country owned by Isabella, and from there in August 1226 they moved to Enno. In end of the Prince of Wales became engaged with Philippa, daughter of Count, and Isabella received money, soldiers and ships. Roger also did not sit idly by. He began to gather troops, and the soldiers recruited by him together with the people allocated by Count Anno began to move to Dordrecht, a port city southeast of Rotterdam. There were no French soldiers in the army, Charles IV was at war in Aquitaine at the time, but even there had been even one, the English barons would not have supported Mortimer. Edward II was well aware of everything and on September 2 ordered the Earl of Norfolk to transfer from East England 2,000 soldiers to Orwell in Suffolk, in order to protect his port from enemy invasion. It was not known for certain why Edward decided that it was Orwell which would be a place to Mortimer's troop to land. It might have been reported by some reconnaissance. 
or maybe it was just because the conclusion that the fleet from Dordrecht was most convenient to go to Orwell, but nevertheless Count of Norfolk did not execute the order and turned to Isabella's side. It seemed Edward did not check the execution of his will. At September 22, 1326, the army of Isabella and Roger on 95 ships went to sea. This army mainly consisted of Flemish, German and Bohemian mercenaries, but there were also a number of volunteers hoping to capitalize on the war, as well as a group of English immigrants and Edward's people who had been sent to France by him but turned to Isabella's side. The information of the quantitative composition of this army diverged from 2,757 according to the Walshingham Chronicles to 500 people according to the Chronicles of Moor. But based on the capacity of 95 ships, which also provided space for horses and necessary equipment, suggests that his army consisted of approximately 1,500 men. Even in medieval terms it was a small army, but Isabella hoped as soon as she and Roger landed on English soil, they would be supported by barons dissatisfied with Edward's rule. In addition, Roger and Isabella probably entered in the secret treaty with Robert Bruce, Scottish King Robert I, according to which Bruce made a promise not to invade English lands until Edward II is dethroned. In fact, it was much easier to depose King than they fought. Having overcome the storm at sea, raging for two days at September 24, Roger and Isabella avoided the royal fleet and landed near Orwell. If the England's ship weren't nearby, of this monarchical will was again not fulfilled. By that time, most of English aristocrats were tired of dispensary arbitrariness. It also became clear that Edward was not inclined to change the established order. The time has come to replace the worthless monarch with his son. Many of Isabella's contemporaries were disposed toward her and believed that she was unjustly offended and that the king was more sinful before her than she was before him. Public opinion soon formed in her favor and more and more barons went over to her side, weakening the royal army. Dispensers along with their supporters fled to Wales, where they counted on the help of tenants. This did not save them. On October 26, the armies of Isabella and Roger took Bristol, and Dispenser the Elder was captured. He was accused of many crimes and put to death the next day, after which his head was sent to Winchester for public display. Dispenser the Younger shared the same brutal fate. On November 16, he and King Edward were captured in Latrisan, not far from Carefully. It was not worthy, but were captured by Henry Lancaster, the brother of Thomas, who was executed in 1322 after the Battle of Boroughbridge. Hugh Dispenser the Younger was transferred to Hereford, where he was sentenced to death for treason, heresy, and homosexuality, after which he was hanged for 13-foot gallows without bringing to strangulation and then castrated and cut into pieces. The king was sent to Kenilford, and on January 12 he was forced to abdicate in favor of his eldest son, who was crowned on February 1st as Edward III. The crowned Edward was sent to Berkeley Castle. The attempt to release him did not succeed. It. Finally, at the parliamentary section in Lincoln, it was announced that Edward had passed away on September 21, 1327. It is not known for certain whether Edward really died that day, or therefore the time and circumstances of his death are still of interest of historians. It was said that Edward's death was caused by natural causes, but it is doubtful, as he was 33 years old. At the same time, there were rumors that Edward was kidnapped According to another version, he escaped. Finally, it was rumored that Edward was killed. In confirmation that Edward did not run away and was not abducted, the body of Farmer King was put up to public display in Gloucester on October 22nd. And there he was buried in the presence of Isabella and the new king, Edward III. On January 30, 1328, Edward III married Philippa, daughter of Count Anna. She was 16 years old, and Edward III was happy in the marriage, at least until he began to cheat on his wife. But in his early years of marriage, he had little time for a family ideal. There were too many worries in running the state. So, hope you liked the story. Like it if you do, subscribe if you don't want to miss more. Thank you very much. Until next time.